They're the most feared predator in the sea. Powerful, ruthless killing machines that rule the oceans. But now, they're the ones under threat. Roughly between 6 and 10 on average, people around the world um, may be killed by a shark every year. We kill about 100 million. Unprecedented levels of overfishing and exploitation mean that many shark species now face an uncertain future. Join me as I head to the Philippines with model and actress Jennifer Dare and the Wild Age Shark Savers team for a close encounter with the largest shark of them all, the whale shark. Wildlife is under threat like never before. Man-made climate change, habitat loss and illegal poaching are devastating the world's environments. We've lost half the animal species on the planet in the last 40 years, and all large marine life could become extinct by 2050. I'm Shawnee Davis, a photographer, filmmaker, and conservationist with a passion for adventure. I've photographed some of Asia's most glamorous celebrities, and now I'm turning my camera on nature's true beauty. I'm out to showcase the glory of the natural world and raise critical awareness about poaching and exploitation. Join me on Adventures to the Edge. Sharks fill us with both fear and fascination. Their size, speed, and razor-sharp teeth fuel the myth of a soulless, cold-blooded killing machine. But from divers and researchers who have spent time with the sharks, there's a very different message. They're not interested in us. They're interested in either swimming around or the right time when they're hungry eating other fish. You know, they're awesome, beautiful, powerful creatures. Hong Kong has long been a major trading hub for all kinds of marine products, especially shark's fin. 50% of the global shark's fin trade passes through the territory, some of it for local consumption, but much of it to be shipped on to China and markets across the globe. I think there's a, a lot of misconception that, you know, sharks are an endless supply, that you can't ever deplete sharks or other fish in the ocean. There's somehow an infinite supply. Perhaps a lack of awareness uh, about the value of sharks in an ecosystem. Sharks, as most people know, or at least the larger sharks, are really the apex predators in the ocean. What happens if you take out those large predators, then the next level down, at the level that they're feeding on, the numbers go up. So small sharks and other fishes might go up, then the level below that, they decline. So you get this cascading effect through the marine ecosystem. In all cases that we know about, I mean, the end results have basically been bad for the ecosystem. On top of this, the practice of removing the fins at sea and simply discarding the body overboard is particularly barbaric, if not wasteful. They need their fins to keep balance and also the movement. So if you take off all the fins and then they will just simply like sink to the bottom. Roughly between 6 and 10 on average, people around the world um, may be killed by a shark every year. We kill about 100 million. So who's more dangerous? Clearly, this continued level of fishing and exploitation is unsustainable. Despite numerous campaigns to reduce shark's fin consumption across Hong Kong and Asia, much work still needs to be done. As just one example, Indonesia remains a top exporter of shark's fin. I saw firsthand the pervasiveness of shark fishing on a recent trip to Lombok Island. In one small fishing village on the east coast, about a dozen sharks were on display, with fishermen selling harvested fins openly on the street, a scene repeated probably a thousand times across Indonesia. And it's not just sharks. Manta rays are also being overfished too. In the past five to ten years, the a market has sprung up for gill rakers, so this is the hard part that's eating the gill, and it's actually the bit that's filtering the plankton. These gill rakers are being sold for quite a lot of money as a health tonic, and we've actually really seen targeted fisheries for mantas. I'm on a journey to produce a fine art photography exhibition for my Project Sea Change campaign to raise awareness about endangered wildlife, including life in our oceans. I want to photograph sharks in their natural habitat, but in a way that's never been done before. I photograph sharks underwater, even great whites in South Africa. 
but this time I'm taking a well-known Hong Kong celebrity and photographing her right up close in the water with the sharks. Actress and model Jennifer Zare has agreed to join me on this expedition to help raise awareness about the shark fin trade. In order to pull this off, we have to learn how to free dive. So we head off to practice in the calm azure blue waters of the Maldives and maybe try free dive with a few sharks. We arrive at the eco luxury resort of Suniva Fushi. Resident freediving expert Ken Kiriyama helps Jennifer master the basics, which is very different from scuba diving and involves holding one's breath for up to four or five minutes underwater. For the photographs, she then tries diving with a long, flowing dress. But despite our many dives, we don't see any sharks or manta rays. Maldives, like many other tropical destinations, has in the past been victim to extensive overfishing. We now head to Cebu Island in the Philippines to dive with one species that epitomizes the majesty of these creatures. It's the largest shark of them all, the whale shark. There's lots of different things that are unique about whale sharks. I mean, the most obvious one that they are the largest fish in the world. So the maximum recorded size, 20 meters, which is just an incredible size. These gentle giants are plankton eaters, filtering vast quantities of seawater through their enormous mouths. Despite their size, they remain very much a mystery. They've never been seen to mate. They give birth to live young. That's never been seen. Where the young, which come out at about roughly about half a meter, they're quite vulnerable to predation. Um, they're very rarely seen. And it's amazing how little we know about them. We head south towards the dive resort of Oslob, a known gathering area for large congregations of whale sharks on their migration routes. With an array of specialist camera equipment, scuba gear, and the Wild Age Shark Savers team, we prep for our first dive. We're joined by two experienced freedivers who are here to provide training, advice, and assistance in the water. The challenge was to get Jennifer to free dive close to the wild shark in a long dress. You know, it was a huge, tall order. Free diving, as the name suggests, is diving without the aid of air tanks or scuba gear. Experienced freedivers can dive to depths of 80 meters or more, staying down for up to six minutes. I won't be asking Jennifer to go that deep, but freediving can be risky. Hypoxia, disorientation, and blackouts are real dangers if you dive too quickly. One of the most dangerous things about freediving is kind of related to the ego problem. People who want to push the limit and uh, break personal record. So freediving is completely different. Inside, you are diving inside of you and you discover your own personal limit and you try to find a way to improve your well-being under the water. That's the real definition of, of freediving. I always wanted to freedive. So I've been scuba diving for years and after finding someone to teach me, I start enjoying and train a lot. In the evening, we practice breathing in the resort swimming pool. Luckily, I don't have to freedive because tomorrow I'm gonna have a scuba tank. But for Jennifer to get the best poses, she really needs to be able to hold her breath for about two minutes underwater. And when you drop in whale sharks into that equation, lighting conditions, visibility of the water, you have a lot of things going on. So it's really hard for her to be able to concentrate, to focus and to be calm. If she panics for whatever reason, then she has to go up and it's gonna make the shoot very difficult. We're out early the next morning and the first dive is a practice run without the dress. All too soon, though, the challenges of shooting underwater come into sharp focus. That was absolutely incredible. I've never seen so many amazing creatures so close before. But I have to say, in terms of the shoot, it was a disaster. There was just so much going on, too many people in the water, too many sharks. I mean, you look left, you look right. Disappointing in terms of the shoot, but great experience to see the sharks. Then another problem crops up that might scupper our dive expedition altogether. The mayor has called up and he wants to have a personal audience with us. Um, not for any good reasons. Apparently we were either getting too close to the sharks or we were using a, an illegal underwater craft, in this case the electrical scooter. But if it doesn't work out, then 
I'm not sure if we can go out and shoot again with the whale shells, which is not good because we didn't get really anything today. Join me in part two to find out whether we get to dive with the whale sharks again or if it's all over and we're sent packing. At one point I thought, okay, this rather expensive expedition is going to come to an end. As part of my quest to document the over-exploitation of endangered wildlife, I'm in the Philippines on a photo shoot with a magnificent whale shark. But not just the whale shark. Model and actress Jennifer Zare has agreed to join the photo expedition to help raise awareness about the shark's fin trade. But the unexpected logistics are adding considerable complexity and bringing unwanted attention from local authorities. The mayor has called up and he wants to have a personal audience with us, not for any good reasons, which is not good because we didn't get really anything today. On top of this, Jennifer has yet to try out free diving in one of the specially commissioned dresses, something we really haven't been able to try underwater yet. Meanwhile, we have to wait for the mayor's office to decide whether we get permission to dive again. Finally, after a lot of negotiations, uh, we managed to get that permission. But, you know, at one point I thought, okay, this rather expensive expedition is going to come to an end. We've got official approval to go and shoot the whale sharks. Without this, we would be stranded here in this 35 degree heat. There's no time to waste. We head back out to the dive site where the whale sharks are already circling. It quickly becomes apparent that the dress is very heavy underwater, producing a lot of drag and hindering Jennifer's ability to swim into position. We need to rethink our strategy, so we head back to the shore. We didn't realize just how many sharks we'd get and also how fast they move and they keep moving in circles. So if I move around, then I see everyone in the shot. She would be underwater already equalized when the whale shark comes. Yeah. So we need to tell her the, the starting point. If you breathe out of the tank, but yeah. at two, three meters maximum, you can hold her alive. The only thing you need to do when you start to swim, to exhale a little bit. And when you go to the surface, make as much bubble as you, you can. Exhale, exhale, exhale when you ascend. The amount of strength that you need to possess just to swim, to get close to the shark, and do it while holding your breath for at least half a minute or a minute, that is challenging. While the rest of the team takes a break, I head out with freedivers Jean-Paul and Susie to get some shots of them underwater. Down below, we're met with an extraordinary sight, huge shoals of sardines that have gathered just off the reef. It's our final day in Oslob. The pressure is building and I have one last chance to get the photograph I'm after. We waste no time and head back out. We now try a longer tailor-made dress with even more material, making it even harder to swim in. But given that we're running out of time, it's a risk we have to take. Luckily, things start to come together. Everyone is in position, the water is crystal clear, and even the whale sharks seem to be cooperating this time. Meanwhile, Jennifer makes a last ditch effort, free diving into position close to the sharks over and over again. I knew we had the shot when that shark just came over. Jennifer had anticipated the shark's movements brilliantly and just floated right over her. And I just knew that that was a great shot. I'm elated. The team are relieved, but we're all exhausted. An incredible effort all around. We leave Oslo with a newfound respect for these gentle giants of the deep. Being up close to such formidable, powerful, yet gentle creatures is a truly once-in-a-lifetime experience. Having a whale shark swim right over you, 10 to 15 meters, it's almost like an alien spacecraft hovering above you and it's truly awe-inspiring. 
While whale sharks are generally protected, many other sharks continue to be slaughtered on an unprecedented scale or to supply a luxury status food. We're finished with fins, no more sharks fin. An outright ban to the sharks fin trade might be too much to hope for. But I hope that these photos will open people's eyes to the beauty of sharks and the need to preserve them for future generations. If we're serious about you know, protecting the ocean and, and the amazing diversity of species in it, we need to do two things. We need to ensure sustainable fisheries management. We also need to establish large, fully protected areas where um, fish can just be. They can simply be. They can rebound in numbers and the greater abundance of these species will actually benefit fishermen. They'll benefit us. It's my hope too that more sustainable fishing practices will be adopted globally, preserving valuable ocean ecosystems and ensuring an adequate food supply for future populations. May the whale shark be a symbol of mankind's balance with the oceans. During this series, I've traveled to some of the wildest parts on the planet, meeting leading conservationists and gaining greater insight into a worsening climate and wildlife crisis. My journey began at the foot of Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania, when I led a team of Hong Kong celebrities 6,000 meters up the mountain, raising much needed funds for charity and awareness about the effects of climate change. In Zimbabwe, bush tracker Stretch Ferreira took me up close to fully grown wild bull elephants. This is just insane. I also went on patrol with the rangers of the IAPF, one of the many frontline NGOs fighting to protect rhinos and elephants in an escalating poaching war. Posing as a poacher, I found out how effective they can be. In Kenya, I photographed Africa's greatest concentration of elephants up close in Amboseli National Park. I learned just how intelligent elephants are and met with Richard Bonham, whose Big Life Foundation has fought hard to reduce ivory poaching in the region. Big Life success in Kenya is not reflected in the rest of Africa where illegal ivory poaching is now killing an estimated 35,000 elephants a year. Do you think it's an Asian problem or do you think it's an African problem? Asian problem. They're the people who are providing the market. Elephants can also be incredibly endearing, as I found out at the David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust, where orphan baby elephants are taken in, looked after 24-7, and given a new lease on life. Being surrounded by curious, playful baby elephants was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. What an amazing introduction to these elephants. I mean, they're quite strong. Yeah, very strong. Surprisingly strong. Inside Kenya's largest national park, I saw how the trust reintegrates these orphans back into the wild, as well as the incredible bonds formed between keepers and elephants. When those young elephants were taken in at the Sheldrick Trust in Nairobi, you see the end of that story here when the orphans come out, roam free and mix with the other wild elephants. In South Africa, the brutal slaying of an innocent rhino mother and her calf for their horns left me shocked and angry. A thousand miles north, leading conservancies in Kenya are doing everything they can to protect the rhino from possible extinction. And like the elephant, I discovered up close just how gentle they can be. So that's uh, six pints in about half a minute. But for one rhino species, it's already too late. At the Old Pegida Conservancy, I met with conservationist Richard Vine. Behind us stood the last remaining northern white rhinos in Africa. Demand for rhino horn is now such that the price payable for rhino horn is equivalent to the price of cocaine or gold. 42-year-old Sudan, the last male of his species. And it's a fairly sad indictment that has led to the extinction of the species. 
the northern white rhino is officially extinct. Photographing the last of a species was a powerful, sobering moment. Even the king of the jungle is under threat. Commercial hunting, human wildlife conflict and competition for land puts lions at odds with communities across Africa. But in Kenya, I saw how a new community initiative has helped lion populations bounce back. The attitude that our planet is filled with unlimited resources put there just for our taking has to change. The exponential destruction of wildlife and ecosystems is clearly unsustainable. All the conservationists I met agree this kind of exploitation will ultimately be our own undoing. I think this is a signal to what humans are doing to planet Earth. Why does it matter? It's just a route to extinction for all of us. And if we destroy the natural world, we destroy ourselves as well. For our own survival, we need to rethink our relationship with all species that share this planet. Through my adventures to the edge of the wild, I've become convinced of the need for change. And there is hope. Probably more important than anything else, the people here realize or look at wildlife as an asset. There's a, um, a younger generation, a much better educated than the older generation about looking after the environment. So, so I'm optimistic for the future. And the well-being of the planet on which we all live is crucially important to humans. We cannot just consume endlessly and irresponsibly. We have to consider what we're killing and what we're depriving future generations from. Once you go out there and see just how incredible the wild is, if people were to go and see the African elephants or to go and dive with the whale sharks, they would never, ever do anything to harm them.